Good morning, Harvest Bible Fellowship friends and family. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. I hope you've had a great day, and I hope things are going well for you. And, uh, well, let me get things set up just for a moment. There we go. I hope you have a great day, and uh, I've enjoyed the music. And to quote Ian Titus, I actually nailed that one. That is awesome. You made my morning, uh, Ian. I uh, hope you're doing good. And I uh, hope you enjoy watching the Veggie Tales now. And uh, so that was awesome. You made my morning. I actually nailed that one, he said. So that's awesome. And uh, we're excited to do that. Hey, I want to show you something. This week, uh, I got a, a pleasant surprise from somebody. And uh, I have to just show it to you. I can't really tell you, but I just got to show it to you. So here it is. I'm a pastor. Unashamedly, I'm a pastor uh, because all the other adjectives weren't available, so they called me pastor. So I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't an official job title, so uh, we'll have to call call me pastor instead. So thank you for that gift this week, and uh, I told you I'd wear it, and I'm wearing it. Wow, what a week! Uh, I've been talking about this the last couple weeks about a time of pandemic. I, raise your right hand and, and right foot if you're tired of it. I, my, mine are both raised. Oh. Uh, I'm so over it. And uh, it's a time of uh, unrest as there are just so many different people who are upset if you do something. They're upset if you don't do something. They're upset about if you say something, if you don't say something. And then they're upset uh, you know, how you said it and so forth. And it just seems like there's no win in any of this, and then it's a time of uncertainty because the job markets are kind of up and down, the uh, uh, financial picture is kind of up and down, but you know what? We serve a God who is not uncertain. Uh, we serve a God who is faithful. He provides, He protects, He is there for us every time we need Him, and I'm so thankful that we have a God that never changes. And I hope that you know that. I hope that you know that you can trust him in all things and that uh, you can rest assured that he is in charge, he's in control, and uh, we don't have to worry about that. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited that God is at work. These are great times. And uh, if you saw on Facebook, we had an opportunity to go downtown and just kind of walk, you know, drive around and find people that we thought we could share Jesus with. And uh, it was a good time. And, uh, you know, they're very open, very receptive. And uh, so we had an opportunity just to plant some seeds, and uh, hopefully some others will come by on water, and uh, God will give some increase down the road. And we're excited about that. We're going to be doing some more of that this summer, Lord willing, and uh, appreciate the time that we had to do that. Before we get too far into, the, uh, into our time of worship this morning, let me just say that uh, uh, we are planning on tentatively opening up on July 5th, which is the first Sunday of July. And uh, we're not sure of all the details yet, but rest assured you'll be getting emails in the mail and maybe a short video concerning some of the things that we're expecting to do and how we're expecting to do them as it draws near. And uh, so just kind of keep your eyes posted for that and uh, attentive to how that may occur. But our plan is tentatively the first Sunday in July. And we're looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to uh, being able to see many of you. So... With that in mind, let's just take a moment and pray, and let me just say, we need to continue to pray for one another in the body of Christ. Um, everyone's weary, mentally, physically, emotionally, everyone's weary. Uh, everyone's ready for a break from all that is going on, and the only thing I know for certain is that God is in control, and I know that because He is in control, that we can trust Him. He is faithful. And uh, he'll give us the strength that we need to keep doing what we need to do for his glory. So let's just pray, and then we'll get into our message this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here, uh, Lord, to look at your word, to apply it to our hearts and our lives. And I ask God that your Holy Spirit would go before us, be with us, and come behind us, Lord, to accomplish your perfect will. Lord, I know that uh, throughout the message, Lord, there may be some areas that we can, Lord, really relate to. And I pray, God, that we would just not coast through this message, but, Lord, that we would truly think it through 
And Lord, take the word of God that you've given to us and apply it to our hearts and our lives that we may become more like you, that, may, that Lord, all of us might be challenged to, Lord, not just coast, not just get through this thing called life, but the Lord, that we would thrive through it, walking in obedience and living, God, with a vibrant faith, Lord, that is real. And so, Lord, I ask God that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, beginning with mine. I ask God that you would challenge me even through the words that you've given to me this day. Lord, be with, Lord, uh, your, your children all around the known world, Lord. Uh, Lord, I know that uh, already the, in this past 24 hours, Lord, there's al already been some bodies already begun to assemble. Uh, Lord, they're already have looked at your word. Lord, they've already uh, sought through services, Lord. And I, I just pray, God, that you would take what has been said around the world and use it for your glory, Lord. Uh, Lord, some of, as we say often, Lord, are meeting underneath trees. Some are in basements. Some are down by the river. Others are in a, a plot of land out in the woods. Uh, Lord, I've seen churches meet in all these locations and many, many more. But, Lord, I pray that wherever your people have gathered or are, are gathering or are about to gather, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be present and, Lord, it accomplish your perfect will. And, Lord, we pray that for our people as well, Lord, for all the friends and family of Harvest Bible Fellowship, I ask, God, that you would just put a hedge of protection about them, Lord. Keep them safe. And, Lord, just in this time of uh, pandemic and time of unrest and this time of uncertainty, God, that you would just be their strength and their shield. And, Lord, that we could just run to you as our shelter and be safe. So, Lord, work in our hearts to draw us closer to you. Uh, Lord, we just pray this morning, Lord, that you would bring conviction where conviction is needed. And, Lord, bring uh, encouragement where encouragement is needed. And, Lord, we'll just be thankful and we'll be quick to praise you for all that you see fit to accomplish. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This morning's title is The Miracle of Bethesda. The Miracle of Bethesda. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I trust that you do, would you turn to John chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 18. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. If you would follow along, as I'm just going to read that. And this morning, I'm going to read it from the New King James. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down into a certain time, at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, Who was cured in the and it is the Sabbath? It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, Who made me well me? Take up your bed and walk. And then they said to him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in a temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The miracle of Bethesda. It's an amazing thing to think of. That, that Bethesda means house of mercy. Bethesda literally means house of mercy. Uh, at this particular place, there were lime, lame and paralyzed and and uh, people of all sorts that uh, uh, were were blind and lame and uh, uh, sick of many different areas. And so there were there were people gathered who wanted to be whole. They wanted to be made healed once again. And here's the interesting thing. These were all people who could not help themselves. Now, so here's an interesting thing. A person who is blind, oftentimes, at least in their early years, needs someone to train them how to deal in this life, deal with this life as a blind person. 
I'm amazed at how much other areas of uh, uh, of their senses are enlightened uh, because of their eyes not working. Uh, I'm amazed that when I see people like Bill Swan and how he can navigate the areas around him and how he can go to work every day and using his stick and using his dog and be able to navigate the world with no eyes. I'm amazed by that. Um, lame people who are not able to walk, they're not able to get up, they're dependent upon other people, they cannot get through life unless somebody is helping them. Paralyzed people who are completely dependent on someone else. These are all people who could not help themselves, at least not initially. So there are many disabled people here that would gather at this pool of Bethesda. In today's world, there are agencies and programs and support groups that would come to the aid of folks like these. However, we can surmise that for many of these disabled fo folks, there was no one. These were people who would gather because there was the word was out. The picture before us is much like us as we come before God. Uh, spiritually speaking, we come to God with sin and we're destined to hell and unable to save ourselves. Completely unable to save ourselves. Completely dependent on the one who can change everything for us. Uh, like the meaning of the name Bethesda, those who experience its miracles receive mercy, and those who come to God through Jesus Christ receive mercy. And so these are people who could not save themselves. These are people who could not help themselves, and they needed mercy from the Lord. So how did the pool work? Well, God's Word reminds us of how, these, how this happened. It says, For an angel went down into, at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now think about this just for a moment. Those who were eager and ready to get into the pool, they would gather. And uh, as you think about it, uh, there are all kinds of people. And you can imagine none of them are, are physically able to, to just, just take off and run for the pool. And uh, can you imagine as the pool is beginning to stir and they're all trying to get in at once, but... According to God's word, verse 4, for an angel would come down and whoever stepped in first. Can you imagine being the first one to get in that pool or the desire to say, I want in and trying to do whatever you could and yet you're helpless to get in on your own. Those who lingered with lack of faith possibly, maybe they tried and tried and tried and they just couldn't do it. Uh, maybe those who are just... Uh, enamored with the thought of watching other people being healed. Uh, but those who wanted to get in the pool, why? Uh, getting in the pool would change everything. Can you imagine being blind and getting into that pool and all of a sudden now, for maybe possibly the first time in your life, you're able to see. Can you imagine not being able to walk? Maybe you have use of your hands, but your legs just don't work. And all of a sudden, you dive into that pool, and you, you run with your arms and your hands, and you get to the edge of the thing, and you dive in there. And maybe for the first time, your legs are beginning to work, and you receive strength, and you begin to walk. Or being paralyzed. Uh, you've ever seen a quadriplegic or, or someone who's been in a terrible accident, accident and they're, they just sit in a wheelchair because they're unable to use their muscles and their nervous system doesn't work. And all of a sudden being able to get into that pool and all of a sudden everything changed. For the person who was in this pool, everything about their life would change. Can you imagine the desire to get in that pool? But the Bible tells us of one man. And I think this is where the story gets interesting for at least many of us. Um, in verse 5 it says this, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Think about that just for a moment. Being with this infirmity, which he doesn't exactly tell us what it is, but we know that it is like that for 38 years. He's there. He obviously wants to see something change in his life. He wants to somehow get in that pool, I believe. But just think about that. Many of us might have given up on the idea of ever being healed after waiting that long with an infirmity. I'll give the man credit. He showed up. Can you imagine? 
38 years living with this infirmity. I can only imagine that as he's as the news is getting out about what's taking place at the pool of Bethesda, he's begging somebody, anybody, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a complete stranger, help me get in. But this is where the story gets interesting. Jesus asks him a question in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, so obviously he doesn't have a lot of strength. He's lying there near the pool. And when Jesus sees him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made whole? Uh, this may be a strange question for someone who's been disabled for this long. Uh, can you imagine being there and Jesus asking you, or at least at this point, he doesn't ex exactly know who Jesus is. And this man comes up to him and says, do you want to be made, made well? Well, this is where it gets interesting. We want something really badly, but we've begun to make excuses and justify our lack of faith. Notice the disabled man didn't scream, yes, I want to be made whole. I don't know about you, but if I, I can only imagine that if I've been this way for 38 years, and all of a sudden some stranger comes up to me and says, do you want to be made whole? I would be like, yeah, of course I do. That's why I'm here. But this, but this man didn't do that. Instead, he answered Jesus with four excuses that justified his lack of faith and the circumstances he was facing. So, I don't know about you, but when you want something really, really bad, how often does it come down to our lack of faith? You see, I, I've all, often believed that in my heart, in my mind, in everything that I know about God, there is absolutely one truth that has never changed. God is ultimately powerful. Amen. There is nothing that God cannot do when it comes to an ability to do the miraculous, to do the unbelievable, to do the impossible. God can do it. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask any number of believers that question, you would wholeheartedly, they would all wholeheartedly say, well, of course, I agree with you, Pastor. There is nothing God cannot do. None of us would refute that. None of us would say, well, there's certain things that God is just not powerful enough. We'd all agree that there's nothing God cannot do. So there's on this mountain a statement, God can do anything. And then on this mountain, but will he? <laughs> and in between it, there's a valley. And that's where most of us live. We know that there's nothing God can't do, but we wonder whether or not he will. And what's in the valley is oftentimes our lack of faith. And God has showed us through Scripture and in various passages throughout the Gospels that if you don't expect God to work, you won't be disappointed. I think oftentimes of when Jesus said, I believe it's in Matthew 13, I could be wrong, I think it's Matthew 13, that Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It wasn't that he didn't have the ability it wasn't that he wasn't powerful enough. It was that they didn't expect him to. They didn't really believe that he would. And he says, well, I'm not going to work here because you're really not expecting me to. So the reality is God is always powerful enough, but oftentimes we don't have faith that he's going to. And I think these four excuses that this man gave Jesus almost in his mind validated why the miracle wasn't taking place. Let's look at these excuses. First of all, there was a problem of predicament. He was in a predicament. And what was his predicament? Well, we see this in the verse. The sick man answered him says, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. He says, I have no man. And the problem with this predicament is this. His dependency was on man rather on God. If man doesn't show up and help me, then, I'm, then, I'm, then I can't do anything. If, uh, if this certain individual doesn't come over and do something for me, well, I'm just kind of stuck in the mud. I'm, I'm sinking in the water. I, 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 nothing's going to change. Very clearly here, his dependency was on someone else to get him into the water. The question I have for this predicament is this. Is God dependent on someone else to do a miracle? Is God dependent on another man to make sure his miracle gets done when he wants it to get done? Or can God work apart 
from mankind. I think oftentimes we've seen throughout Scripture that God works apart from mankind. Oh, it's wonderful when he uses man, but he's not dependent upon man. And so our dependency should not be upon man to help God. God can do it. So oftentimes we get the idea that, well, unless so-and-so helps me do this, unless so-and-so helps me do that, well, then I just not gonna, nothing's going to change and it's just not going to get done. And it really reveals that our faith is in man more than it is in God. And when that happens, we're going to possibly miss an opportunity to see God at work in our lives. And so he had a predicament. And his predicament was, I have no man revealing that his dependency was on man rather than God. Number two, there was a problem of perception. A problem of perception. He says, when the water is stirred, when the water is troubled. I mean, God cannot heal. God cannot work unless it's in this particular spot at this particular time. How often have we said a a time limit on God. How often have we put stipulations on how we want God to work? How often have we said, God, you have to work in this way? It's almost as if we're putting God in a box. And there was a perception to this man who had been lying there for 38 years or, or lame for 38 years and was lying there that God could only work when the water was troubled. His dependency was on the outward physical circumstances more than on God. You see, God works in ways that we can't imagine. And at this moment in his time, he was convinced that God could only work when the water was troubled. If we expect God to work on our terms, guess what? Oftentimes we're going to be disappointed. We're going to be left discouraged, frustrated. But you have to know this. God can work in ways that we can never imagine. When's the last time we said, God, you have to do it right now. And God just says, wait a minute. If I do it now, you're going to miss the blessing. And if you'll wait a little bit longer or do it in a different fashion, then the reality is I'm going to do it better than you even expected it. You see, I believe at the end of the story, God even did it better than what he wanted. But he had a problem with perception. I can, God, God's only going to work when the water is troubled. Revealing his dependency was an outward physical circumstances more than on God. Number three, there was a problem of placement. Placement. I can't get into the water. Because unless I can get down in there, it's not going to change. Well, he was unable. I don't know how he got to the pool that day. I don't know if somebody had to carry him there. I don't know if somebody had to lift him up and physically put him in that spot. But in his mind, why bother? Uh, I can't get into the water. You see, as soon as I try to get into the water, something else happens. See, God can only work in a certain place. The word about Jesus performing miracles had obviously gotten around town. Jesus had performed many, many miracles um, in many places. Obviously, the word was out. However, the disabled man was under the impression that Jesus could only help him if he could get into the pool. So there is a problem of placement. How often are we eager, if you will, to set the parameters in which God can work? How often do we say, well, God, if you don't do this, well, then I can't. And we put stipulations on how we want to see God do something. Then there's a fourth problem. is one of position. He wasn't in a position to help himself, and somebody else stepped in before him. So every time the water would begin to stir, can you imagine the, the rush of everyone trying to get into the pool? I mean, picture this in your mind's eye. Because whoever was in first. But every time somebody was going to get in before him. See the problem here is that he limited Jesus in believing he had a limit as to how many he could heal. And he didn't feel like he was in a position to be healed. Someone else would get in before him. 
Jesus is only going to heal that man, that woman, or that person, or this person. He's only going to, his condition or her need, I'm going to wall her in my pity. Because God cannot do what I need him to do. Well, Jesus is only going to heal. No. You see, he was in a position that God could only do a certain limit or a certain way in his healing. So oftentimes, these problems that we just use to justify our lack of faith, whether it's the predicament that we're in, the perception that we have, the placement of where we're at in life, the position of other people getting in ahead of us, regardless of what it is, they all hindered his faith. Is God able? Well, we know that he is. But what often hinders actually seeing him work? Our lack of faith. Now, let me just say this. Does God just say, well, if you have all the faith in the world, he's going to absolutely do it? No. See, there's a lot of things that you can do as far as putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And God may have other plans. And that's okay. But don't let all the other things and the hindrances in our life be what deters him from being able to work. What excuse might we be using to hinder our faith? What is challenging our faith? What is getting in the way of us moving forward for the cause of Christ? What is getting in the way of us begging God to do what only God can do? Is it one of these same things, a, a problem of predicament or perception or placement or position? Hopefully those things are not hindering our faith. Jesus chose to work in a different way. He didn't work the way the man wanted him to work or thought he would work. If that would have been the case, Jesus might have showed up and said, Hey, get him in the pool. Hurry up. Hurry up. Get him in the pool. But he didn't do that. He chose to work in a different way. And as I said earlier, I believe it was a different way, a better way. He never had to get wet. He didn't have to get thrown into the pool. Jesus simply said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now just put yourself in this man's position just for a moment. He hasn't walked for 38 years. He's been an invalid of some sort. He's had to be completely dependent on other people. Can you imagine just for a moment, someone saying to someone who's blind, open your eyes and look at me. Well, how can I do that? I'm blind. Or somebody who can't speak, but can hear. Talk to me. He probably doesn't know, understand what that means. Or somebody who's been in an accident and can't, hasn't walked in years. Maybe they severed a spinal cord. Maybe their nervous system has shut down and they just can't walk. Rise up. Initial thought might be to say, are you crazy? Do you understand what you're asking me to do? You're setting me up for more discouragement, more frustration, because I know this can't work. But as I said earlier, I give this man credit. He showed up. He obviously wanted to be healed. And Jesus looks at him at this moment and says, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And here's what happened according to verse 9. And immediately the man was made well took up his bed, and walked. Jesus chose to work in a different way. Think about this. Jesus doesn't have to work. God doesn't have to answer our prayers in a way that we demand, in a way that we assume, in a way that we expect. Oftentimes, God does it in a way that we don't expect. And in a way that is often better than what we expect. As he did for this disabled man. And as you see here. In verse 14 he says. See you have been made well. Sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. I want to address it just for a moment. And I'm not going to take a lot of time here. But I want to address it just for a moment. There are some, there may be some disagreement about the inference of this verse here in verse 14. 
But there's two things here. Some sin does cause sickness. Uh, there is an inference maybe that something that he had done had caused his sickness, his disease, his um, being in being uh, uh, lame. In Psalm 107, verses 17 and 18, and James chapter 5, verse 15, it leads us to believe that there are sometimes our sinfulness, or some things about our sinfulness that causes a sickness. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, it says, Many, because of their actions, are sick among you, and they sleep. They die. God's word has revealed to us that sometimes it is a sinfulness that causes a sickness or death even. I don't know if this is particularly the case, but I know that it was a possibility. Because he says, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. But secondly, not all sickness is a result of sin. And we see that in John chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 13. And we see this where, you know, whose sin has caused you to be sick? You know, was it your father's sin or your mother's sin? And this was not the case. So it wasn't an opportunity to judge. But at the same time, Galatians chapter 6 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The reality is that not all sickness is a result of sin, but some sickness is a result of sin. So we need to guard our actions. We need to guard our thoughts. We need to guard how we live our life, because of however a man sows, that shall he also reap. But to me, the issue in this passage is that there was a man who was disabled. He had been this way in this, in this condition for 38 years, and he showed up at the pool. And as the word Bethesda means, looking for mercy. The word was out about town. Whoever's in that pool first is going to be healed of whatever ails him. And he wanted healing. And here's where I see his, this man's faith. He could have sat there on the ground when Jesus asked him, Do you want to be made well? He didn't stay there on the ground. It says immediately he got up, took up his bed and walked. He did what Jesus asked him to do. He exercised his faith at some point. So he was able to turn the predicament and the placement, and the position, and all these things that had hindered his faith into a step of action. And he did what Jesus told him to do. See, at some point, folks, we have to get to the place where we stop making excuses. Well, so-and-so. No, no. It, so what so-and-so does is on them, and in between them and God. You're responsible for your actions. You're responsible for how you live your life. How you act and how you react is between you and God. And you are responsible for them. This man decided to do what God asked him to do. He departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. He was willing to confront the Jewish folks and say, this man was Jesus. Here's a question I have for many of us. If you've been touched by Jesus, who are you telling about Jesus? Has, if Jesus has changed your life, if he has healed you in some fashion, if he has answered your prayers, if he has made you his child, if you've come to know him and have a relationship with him, who are you telling about him? I can only imagine in my mind, just for a moment, imagine with me. You've been blind for 38 years. Lame for 38 years. Paralyzed, maybe, for 38 years. Or for whatever amount of time. And Jesus steps into your life and changes everything. I wouldn't imagine that. I, if that were me, I, I, I couldn't walk and now I'm, I'm jumping up and down on my own two feet. I'd be screaming. If I couldn't see and now I can see, I'd be screaming. I'd be, I'd be checking everything out, just seeing everything in sight. In the same way, spiritually, when God does a work in our life, do we use it as an opportunity to praise Him and tell others? 
this man went out and told everybody. The man departed, verse 15, and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Of course, the Jews didn't like it, and they sought to kill him for it. But here's the thing. This man was so touched and moved that he went and told. He didn't care who he told. Jesus is able. The question is, do you have faith? Do you believe that he is able to do what only he can do? See, if you're depending on man to do what only God can do, you're going to be disappointed. If you're depending on circumstances that man can control, you're going to be disappointed. If, if God can only work in a certain way and God doesn't choose to work that way, you're going to be disappointed. You're setting yourself up for disappointment and frustration. Why not just surrender it to God? And let him work how he chooses to work. But what that requires of us is faith without excuse. Faith without excuse. Simply saying, God, I surrender it to you. And I'm trusting you to do what you feel is best. And in the end, he'll be glorified with that. I trust that you'll be honest with yourself today. There's some things that you want to see God do. Maybe it is something personal with your health. Maybe it's something emotional, it's, uh, struggles that you're going through that are going through your mind, your emotions, your will. You're trying to depend on persons and peoples and th and things and circumstances to change, but something only God can do. Will you just trust Him? Will you surrender the circumstance to Him? Will you just put your complete faith in that he's not going to do anything apart from what is best for you and apart from that which will bring glory to him? That's what we all need. And I challenge you today to do that, to be honest about it. What is hindering your faith? What excuses are you using? And in the long run, is hindering God from working. Because God doesn't have to do it how we want him to do it. He's... Ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Our goal is just to trust Him completely and surrender everything to Him and to see how He wants to work. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as we come before you again, Lord, what an incredible story of a paralyzed man who for some 38 years was helpless I'm sure dependent upon those around him to, to get through life. But God, at some point, he took a step to get to the pool of Bethesda. Lord, he somehow worked it out. Maybe somebody carried him there. Maybe he had friends or families or acquaintances. Maybe he was a complete stranger, Lord, but he wanted to get there. Because in the back of his mind, there was a possibility. Not without excuse. He wanted somebody else to, to get him into the pool. He was frustrated that as he tried, somebody else would get in ahead of him. He was frustrated that he couldn't move fast enough when the pool was stirred and troubled. Lord, he made all kinds of excuses, but Lord, he showed up. And Lord, I pray that just as he received mercy at the pool of Bethesda, Lord, that we might seek your face and, Lord, know that we'll receive mercy when we do it. Lord, help us to remove excuses. Help us not to look to man to solve our problems because man cannot solve our problems. But, God, help us to be fully focused and faithful to you, Lord. Lord God, would you increase our faith God, would you help us to become totally dependent upon you and surrender to you in all things. And I pray, God, that you'd be real to us. Lord, may we sense your presence daily in all that we say and do. And we'll praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you are here today, I trust that you'll challenge yourself in the presence of God. 
to see if there's anything that's hindering your faith. Maybe it's something completely different than what I mentioned today. But surrender it to God and what you're asking Him to do, what you need to see God do in your life. Completely surrender to Him. Trust Him to do what is best for you. I trust that you've uh, had a great time this morning learning from God's Word from Pastor Mike in Sunday School, Pastor Jim in uh, his Sunday morning devotional to us and maintaining our focus, and now through the miracle of Bethesda. I pray that you will see God at work in your life. I pray that uh, you'll have a great week in seeing God do some great things. And as you are worshiping Him this week, continue to go back and share these messages. Uh, if you know that one of these messages will be a particular to, uh, encouragement to somebody, share it in Messenger. And uh, let God use this these messages to encourage your walk with Him. So worship Him through the Word, worship Him through the music, and worship Him through your giving this week, and I trust that uh, you'll see God at work in your life. And just remember the quote for the week, taken from our very own Ian Titus. I actually nailed it! I actually nailed that one! That was awesome, Ian. Love you, buddy. Can't wait to see you. Have a great week, folks. Thanks.